Well, Magne, welcome to Gibbo Goes One on One. What's been going on, brother? Um, yeah, not much, mate. Just trying to stay sane during these, you know, crazy times, and obviously trying to stay fit and you know stay on top of my game while there's no access to basketball courts and whatnot. So it's been a bit of a challenge, but you know, just taking it for what it is. We've been given kind of home programs um, to do at home. Have the board's given you guys anything to try and work on and keep fit and keep busy while you can't obviously get out onto a court? Yeah, so uh, we've been given, you know, um, home gym programs if, you know, don't have access to a gym, so keep getting your strength up. Um, obviously, not everyone has a little basketball hoop or anything at home, but just um, some basketball skills workouts and and just some running programs as well. So, I mean, you do them as you please, but I mean, there's not much else to do at the moment, so I've been trying to smash them out. Down here in uh, Victoria, this kind of last week, we just kind of opened up saying that we can... We can get back on court this week. We started Monday, still limited like restrictions, one person per half court. Have you guys been freed up to kind of do that stuff in Brisbane and be able to get workouts in? Uh, so not not really. Um, to my understanding, I think the next date is um, June twelfth is when indoor sports start to get um, a bit of leniency in that. Um, outdoor sports here have kind of been given the go ahead with those sort of restrictions. Um, but yeah, indoor sports at the moment um, are still pretty pretty restricted and whatnot, which is a bit, you know, unfortunate for us. But I mean, like I said, it is what it is, and you just got to deal with it. So towards uh, towards the end of the, uh, I think the end of the NBL season, or just after you hurt yourself, um, was it a quad injury, I think, or a groin? How how did that how did that all how did that take long to fix? Obviously, you had a lot of time now to get it fit and healthy. But how was that? Yeah, so uh, happened. I think it was in the first quarter of the of the last game, um, and I mean it was just a small um, quad quad tear, um, low grade. So, I mean it was it would have been about a week had I to keep playing, but um, I took about three weeks um, just to make sure I really got it right. And uh, I mean I didn't have anything on and anything to push forward to. So I mean uh, the medical staff with the bullets and myself just um, really took our time with it to make sure it was it was on point. Obviously, um, isolation allows you to be at home. You move back home with the family. How's it been being around Brett and your mum and, and having everyone at the house, uh, keeping everyone kind of busy and probably going insane a little bit as well, having all the, all the family back in the one house? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I guess it was, it was good to start with. Um, Campbell, Campbell moved home, older brother moved home as well. Um, so, I mean, it hadn't had the family home together for about five years. So, uh, finally good to have everyone back and whatnot, but... Um, yeah, starting to go a bit insane, just kind of getting on everyone's nerves and whatnot. But um, I mean, I, I try and keep myself busy as well, get out of the house as much as I can, um, take the dog for a walk or something, um, just to get away from them. But I mean, everyone's been been good, and everyone's in the same situation, so uh, I try my best to not get on their nerves, and, and I, we've been pretty good about it. Your dad, uh, your dad. I know your dad likes to go camping with the boys, take a keg, and go and hide away for a while. Has he been? <laughs> has he been able to do that during this isolation, or has he had to to kind of stay at home? No, he's had to stay at home, man. He's uh, he's going a bit crazy with that stuff as well, because um, you know, he's trying to set up his his car and whatnot. Um, but yeah, they've shut down all the all the camping sites and all the, and everything. So he's uh, you know, he's looking for little hobbies to to keep himself motivated and stuff through these times as much as everyone else is. And you just mentioned about the car. He's he's had some different cars. Right? He likes to buy different kind of unique cars. <laughs> had like the combi van. Uh, oh, does he that or what's he what's he into now? Mate, it's never ending. Um, yeah, so I mean, he's probably since I've uh, been with the Bullets, he's probably had about 10, 10 different cars. Um, so yeah, he's just he's just sold his Mustang. Um, he's got his combi in the garage at the moment. He just sold another combi that he's had. Um, Pontiac came in few months ago then he sold that uh so he's just i mean i think that's you know it's one of his hobbies just kind of importing cars and flipping them and you know keeping himself busy in that in that regard but he's got a little suzuki that he's uh, hotting up at the moment to to go camping with and that thing's a bit of a beast so um hopefully he doesn't sell that i might take it for a spin when this sort of all opens up something um something creaking myself have done here in our house went and bought a fire pit and it's pretty cool just to light that at night time and go and cook up some food. I know you have a, a fire pit at your house. You guys being down there as a family just sitting around that um, at night times and, and firing that thing up? Yeah, well, 
we uh we have been and then uh we uh lit it up the other night just trying to cook some food and whatnot and uh someone someone calls a fire brigade on us so it turns out turns out in queensland you're not allowed to have just open fires um wow. and whatnot, unless you're, you're actually cooking food so yeah sure enough the fire engines going off out the front and <laughs> mate, it was a whole scene you know, like the yeah anyway so uh we're a bit uh skeptical now about lighting the fires but i mean as as you know brisbane uh brisbane winters are pretty nice so if we can kind of sneak one in every now and then i think we'll, we'll do that if we can we haven't had the fire brigade called down here yet so uh, <laughs> we'll keep an eye on that um you mentioned your brother um campbell if anyone doesn't know is obviously a rugby union player played in Japan professionally, played for the Queensland Reds, been down here in Melbourne, the Rebels. Tell yeah. me about growing up in that household too. I mean, I know you're a bit taller. He's probably a bit bigger now. Um, tell yeah. me how that was growing up with a similar age brother, both competitive, both a little aggressive. How was that growing up and the battles and fights you probably would have had in the backyard? Uh, yeah, so it was, it, was, uh, it was all right. He's actually a, a bit of a better athlete than I was growing up. So he's always a bit of a sprinter and and whatnot. So he's in the um, you know always doing track and field and whatnot. So I never really had a chance um, to beat him in any stuff like that because he was not quite as fast. But as I started to get bigger and and um, grow a bit taller and started to overtake him, I think he got a bit jealous height wise. So then that's when the the fist fight started coming out just to make sure he could assert his dominance still. And um, I mean I won I won a fair few, but I'd say he he won most of them. But it was an awesome, I guess it's awesome growing up with an older brother that's competitive as well. Like you go out, you know, and he always pushes you and, and you see how hard he pushes himself. And I guess, you know, I learned from an early age that that's what it takes to be successful in, in sport. And because he, he was always succeeding at a high level. So, I mean, even this past sort of six weeks when he's been home, he's just been, you know, every day out there running, bringing me with him. Hey, you want to come for a run? How hey, we need to go to the gym? We need to do this. Like he's always pushing himself, and you know, I mean, he's a he's an awesome role model in that in that sense that um, he's you know no nonsense and let's get this done, let's get out of here. So pretty pretty lucky growing up with with someone like him in my house. I seen a video you posted I think last week. You two playing a bit of one on one in the backyard. Uh, Did you have any kind of basketball skills or is oh, he mate, no? He's aw he's awful. He's uh. He tries to just just truck truck through and whatnot, but he's picked it up, double dribble, travel, puts it back down. Got no left hand, so oh, he, he's awful. But you know, like I said, he's a pretty good athlete, so he can get up and dunk it. And every now and then, so you got to be got to be a bit careful around him. But um, no, I, I gave him the business, so don't have to worry about that. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure you two have got in yourselves into a bit of trouble over the over the years growing up. I remember being at your house for a barbecue, and I was sitting down talking to your mum and. You have a younger sister live, and your mum was like, "She's the worst one out of the three of you guys." <laughs> she uh, she holds her own as well. Yeah, she uh, she, she's interesting growing up. You know, she's a little bit different um, to Campbell and I. Like, maybe not as competitive athletically, but still loves sport. Um, so it's been interesting watch her, watching her grow up in our household, where Campbell and I are always trying to push her, and and she's sort of more and more sort of more academically focused. Um, but you know, still, still out there partying and whatnot, like a like a teenager, you know, like they should be. So, I mean, she she's awesome too. She's really mature for her age and gets along really well. So she she fits right in with her family. And I mean, I, I love it a bit. And yeah, you know, she she asks me if I'm okay and takes care of me as well as much as I do for her. So, I mean, she's awesome to have around. And yeah, yeah. love it. I'm sure, like every athlete growing up, you would have played multiple sports. Probably rugby was one of them. Yeah. Um, tell me about the state of your basketball career, you know, being in Queensland and then how you got yourself uh, away to college to Tulsa. Yeah, so like you said, just um, growing up, just touched, touched a few different sports. And, you know, I, I always enjoyed getting out and doing stuff and um, keeping active and sort of went from everything from, you know, athletics to swimming to rugby was probably my main, my main sport growing up. Um, and then when I was about 14, uh, a man by the name of Wayne Larkins came and gave me a tap on the shoulder and said, hey, mate, like, you're, you're pretty big. You move pretty well. Like, you want to give basketball a crack? And at the time, had no other sport going on. So I thought, oh, I may as well, you know, keep active and whatnot. And then, you know, first practice, just went in, loved it. And, you know, sort of never never looked back since. Um, picked it up from there. And then when I was 16, got a 
invite to the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, and then obviously, obviously took that up and spent sort of 18 months there um, developing, you know, my body and my game and against some of the best in Australia. Uh, from there, was lucky enough to get a few college offers. One from the University of Tulsa, which is where I, I ended up ended up going after my visit. Um, and I mean, I, I loved it there too. It was awesome experience, you know, for those who've played college, it, it's obviously a very different game. It's more athletic, a lot faster, you know, more, um, yeah, just, just faster really. Like, so learning that different style of, of game for me was huge and the different styles of coaching that goes on overseas and whatnot. Um, and then learning sort of how to grow up and be a man, like away from my family and, you know, like I deal with issues myself and, and whatnot when they're not there. So I love that. And then luckily enough, at the end of my first year, the Bullets um, gave me a shot to come back after working out with them in the off season, um, which, you know, obviously you were around for that. So I think I was doing okay in some of those workouts. And, you know, I think Dre kind of liked the way I was going and just, yeah, gave me a shot. So what, um, what, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I wish I had gone to college just to experience the whole thing. Um, I don't regret not going, but I wish I had, you know, sampled it for a little bit. Um, mm. You obviously had that decision to come back as a development player, not a contracted player with the Bullets to start yep. out. Um, what made you decide to leave college um, and not stay and be there longer compared to coming back and, I guess, being around as a DP and not a, a contracted? I know it was... You know, designed to have you a, a contract to play the year after, but you know, coming yeah. back to be a DP instead of staying in college another year. Yeah, so I think it, it was a tough decision, and um, a lot of thought went into it. But I think just talking with with dad and and um, a few mentors that I have in basketball, it was it was more where I thought I would develop the best um, over those three years. So you know, it was a three year deal with Brisbane, and I had three more years left in college, and it was a toss up between all right at the end of this of these three years, like where am, where am I going to be the most developed? Where do you think I'll, I'll thrive the most? And I mean, in those bullets workouts, I was getting my ass kicked most of the time, you know, by kicks, you know, Tommy Jervis was, you know, beat me up. Tory Craig was there and I was just thinking like this, like get my ass kicked, like this is where I need to be. I need to be competing against people that are better than me to, to push me every day. And, and that was sort of the main sort of decision for it was where am I going to get better? And at the end of the day, we came to Brisbane and, and I mean, I feel like at the end of the three years, it's kind of paid off for me. So, how was that? How was that jump going from playing against obviously kids, college kids your own age, to coming in and playing against guys? You know, Kicks is probably ten years older. Um, mm -hmm. Tommy, you know, Peach. Uh, the difference between obviously kids and then coming in against grown men that obviously know the tricks of the trade and I had to, you know, bully and and do all that stuff. How was that kind of transition? Yeah, it was it was uh, interesting. Um, obviously. What I think what I learned pretty quickly um, in that environment was that they're playing for a job um, and, and that's the environment you're coming into is, like, okay, this is my career now and I'm competing every day for a job. So, um, but yeah, like you said, that experience and just sort of took advantage of my youth and um, just throwing shot fakes and, you know, I was just going flying for them and, you know, I was a bit lighter in the pants then. So they're just sort of, Peach used to just give me give me beat downs as well, and I mean you you could probably back me down back then back as a DP. So, um, but I mean it, it was cool. It was going against you know some of the best players in the NBL, and yeah, it's awesome. And then kicks kicks Daniel Kickett's probably one of the best low post footwork big men. I mean I've probably ever played with. Um, you like I mean I remember some you know after practice some workouts and one on one stuff with him and just kind of picking his brain a little bit of that, that footwork and stuff that he's so good at. Yeah. He, he's, uh, he's interesting. Cause you know, I, I always thought him as a young fellow, he was on my ass and I was like, Oh, you know, this guy hates me. But as I kind of come to learn now, he just wanted me to get better and um, he wanted to see me thrive as well. So, um, but yeah, after practice, you know, just him, him helping me how to exploit him in training, like how do I beat him? And that was, I guess interesting for me because I was like, oh, why is he trying to help me be better than him in training? It was just kind of weird, but um, but yeah, he, he used to help me a lot and pick my brain, and I, I picked his brain, I guess. But and then when it came to practice, he was competitive as ever and wouldn't back down, and he, he, it wouldn't be friendly um, on the court and whatnot. But off the court and after practice, you know, he's always up for a chat and um, willing to help me out. Um, 
obviously, you know, coming in first year, I'm coming in that first, you know, few months, whatever, I'm sure there would have been times where you kind of, do you ever regret or do you ever think, did you ever, ever have moments in those, you know, first six months of coming back of like, oh shit, this is tough or, you know, maybe I should have stayed in college another year or, you know, maybe oh, yeah. I'm not quite ready or what am I doing here kind of thing? Oh yeah. Um, I, I'd say, yeah, every, every day, if not every second day, you know, something goes wrong you don't do well at training it's just like you know damn it like maybe i've made the wrong call maybe i'm too young to be here you know and that that just kind of um lingers around a bit and i think learning how to deal with that was a big part of it as well just um just reassuring yourself that no like hold up like i am meant to be here i'm good enough you know i've I've proven i've proven this and you know you have a good days and bad days as much as anyone else but um, just learning how to reassure yourself and, and give yourself confidence to go out there and compete, even if you're going to lose every day. It's competing to get yourself better. So that was a big part of it. I talked to uh, Chris Goulding about this. He, he went from DPs to multiple teams or whatever. Um, and then finally, you know, he was a contracted player. How's the, how's the mindset changed from being a training guy, DP, to now you're actually in the 10 or the, the 11 and just how much more confidence that gives you, you know, as a player and the mindset that kind of changes with that? Yeah, for sure. Like it's it's obviously a massive difference um, coming in as one of the dudes. It's oh, I might get you know five five reps in a, in a training session, and then all of a sudden you you know oh yeah, well I'm on the starting big, and you know we're getting you five touches this this scrimmage. So um, it's it's huge, and I think what comes with a lot of it is well with confidence is like the coaches and and your teammates just backing you. You know you make mistakes and. I've always had great teammates in such as yourself, you know, like I'd, I'd stuff up, miss a shot and you'd just go, oh, don't worry, like next, you know, next play, next play. And I think that that, that kind of doesn't stop even when you're a contracted player. You, I feel like you kind of get down on yourself every now and then and, and sometimes you just need a little pick-me-up um, for whatnot. But, I mean, once you're in that spot, you just, your confidence just grows by yourself. Like you, you know that everyone wants you to take shots and you're willing to try stuff out and, um, I think a lot of it comes with working outside of training sessions as well, putting in the extra work, knowing that you can take shots like that and just building that confidence in yourself. This question is probably going to put you on the spot. And I've got two that I think are kind of crucial to uh, you changing um, as a player, I think more mentally than anything. Do you, have, do you have any moments throughout your first couple of years in Brisbane where you kind of Switch from switch from being you know just a player to like you know a serious player. Do you have anything that comes in mind when you know situations or anything that, that happened that you're like, oh yeah, now I'm now I'm now I'm switched on. Um, yeah, you did throw me on the spot there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I guess you know I I probably thought my first couple of years that um, I was better than I than I was um, and thought I was deserving of, of more minutes and whatnot and I think um, my exit interview before this last season um, was very eye-opening and and sort of that was a very defining moment for my career I'd say um, and it's basically just you're not where we want you to be and and you're probably not where you want yourself to be either so you need a good sort of next 12 months and and, and then we'll see what happens after that so it kind of went from all right, let's get serious. Like, all right, like this isn't a joke. Like I might not have a job next year. Um, so I think that that sort of moment probably flicked the switch for me a little bit um, and just sort of had had a pretty good 12 months. I remember um, a couple of times at, at practice, it was around the same, like probably within a few weeks, I think you're injured or whatever. And anyone that doesn't know Mika Vicona knows that he would run through a brick wall. He played with half torn Achilles in our semi-final series against Perth, wanted yeah, to play the last right. game. and. Yeah. I remember two two examples. Um, there was one time at practice, I think you hurt your knee or rolled your ankle and kind of went down for a little bit. And then Mika kind of, as he does, just yelled at you, get your ass up off the floor. So there was that one. And, and I think it kind of, I mean, I was, when he yelled it out, I was kind of taken back a little bit, but I, I feel like there was that moment. And then um, I think after that, when you were still injured, um, and I think he might have been injured, but he took you on the back courts and did the three-minute run when it wasn't scripted to do. It wasn't like you guys had yeah. to go and do it. He was just like, Will, come on. Now, this is like a 15, 16, 17-year-old vet. It's like, you know, trying to, I guess, show you the ropes and show you that you can push through more than, than what you probably can. And I remember watching that thinking, shit, this is, this is going to change Will as a, as a player. And I feel like not necessarily just that. Obviously, a lot of work's gone into it, but that 
mindset yeah. kind of changed a little bit from that. Yeah, for sure. And I think Mick is obviously a, I don't know, like you said, just an absolute warrior and a battler. And, and I think that day, like I remember that day, like it was, you know, like I had, I think I dislocated my finger um, like two days before or something and quite, couldn't quite move my hand. And so Mick was like, all right, we're running today. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> He's like, no, no, I mean, you were going to run today. And he's like, get your run shoes on when you go for a run. So, I mean, when I saw, like you said, a 15-year veteran lace him up on a, you know, a day where he's scheduled not to practice and he ran as much as I did. And, like, that was like, okay, this is, this is the level that, that I need to be at and this is what it takes to be, to be, I mean, to stay in the league for 15 years. Yeah, I, I remember that like it was, like it was yesterday and, I mean, Mick is the next level when it comes to playing through stuff that he shouldn't. Yeah. So he hasn't always been the smartest, but I mean, just a role model, I, I would have loved as being a foreman or a bigger guy, learning off him and learning the craft off him and all these tricks and trades that is so, so invaluable. And a lot of it doesn't show up on the scoreboard and no one really sees what he does, but uh, it impacts, I, th I feel like it impacted our whole team as a club to change our whole mindset from one year to the next when he came in. And I feel like that helped us move forward a long way. Yeah, for sure. And you know, he, you know, like going against him every day at practice, you realize how hard he works. And because you have to work just as hard to stop him from doing what, you know, what he wants to do. So every day, just, you know, he's, he's keeping me flat stick, just every offensive rebound. He's, you know, got his arm in my, in my back, pushing me off, holding me down, like just being an absolute, you know, warrior. And I mean, he's been valuable since day one he entered the league. And I think like he was huge for us. Obviously, when you're at the boards, and then this year as well, like he had a bit of a, a his role wasn't as big this year, but I think just his voice, and even when he came on the court, he'd get you know two O boards, set a hard screen, probably get an illegal one, but you knew he'd come in to set, to set the tone for five minutes, and then you know do his job and come out. Um, and then obviously off seasons, off seasons I think are massive for young players trying to improve, get better at their game. Um, one thing you did really well this last off season was um, you know play QBL one, which is now NBL North, NBL one North, whatever it's called. Yeah. For the Capitals, and I remember back a few years ago when Nathan Sobe he went and did the same thing. He went back to his hometown in Warrnambool. Um, obviously, got to play you know every minute, got to shoot a lot of the ball and make a lot of plays. And I feel like him going back and dominating in that league, his next year in the NBL was massive. Mm. Um, when you went back and played with Kitty and, and Sammy Mack at the Capitals, I feel like because you had such a dominant year there, you know, blocking all the shots and scoring a lot of points and had a lot of the ball, I feel like that kind of sped up your progress a little bit and allowed you to have such a good year this year. Yeah, and I think you're right. Um, I think, you know, building or just building that body of work by playing basketball, I think that was the biggest thing. Like the first sort of two years of my contract, I hadn't played that much basketball um, you know, obviously not playing much in NBL games, you know, trying to stay fit, all that, all that, whatever. But I think just having the, like you said, having the ball in my hands, understanding where I can score, how I can score, how I can impact the game when, you know, when I'm not hitting shots, learning how to push through, you know, play 40 minutes a game, learning how to push through that when you're tired, how to still be effective and, and whatnot for your team. So obviously that, that was huge for me. And I think more than anything, it was just playing more basketball that, that helped me sort of just get in shape and, um, and you know, get, get the ball in my hands and try some new things out as well. Sammy Mack was obviously your coach for that. Um, you know, played millions of games and probably one of the best three, four men Australia's produced. How, how good's it been, you know, I guess being coached by him, not just there, but at the Bullets, kind of picking his brain and having him help you out with... You know, all I guess all aspects of the game because he kind of did everything. You know, he wasn't a great shooter. He wasn't great at one specific thing, but he was really good at a lot of them. Um, how good has that been? I guess being tutored by him, I guess for the last few years. Yeah, he. I mean, Sammy's been, I guess, a part of my career since I was young. Um, he coached my state team under 16s and under 18s, or both under 18s. Um, and so he's he's always been around. And he's always been someone that I could sort of go to and 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 ask questions and whatnot. But um, but I guess he's kind of young enough still that he still thinks he's a player. So um, he looks at the game through a player's eyes. And I think having that as a coach uh, with me, I, I think especially helps. It's kind of how I learn. And I think he understands that. So I think we, we get along really well. And he just whispers something to me at training about how 
how maybe what I should have done or maybe how I can affect the next play or and then yeah so we have a lot of sort of dialogue throughout training and whatnot but like you said I mean he's he's one of the best players Australia's ever created and just to have him on my side and, and have him want want me to do the best is is pretty special in itself so did you have um? Do you have an idol growing up? Did you like you know mirror your game or want to be like this person? I love going to watch this person. Or was there anyone specific that you were like? I honestly, man, not really. Like I obviously didn't start playing till I was late, uh, like fourteen. So, and even then, I was just kind of playing for fun, um, and then started taking it seriously sort of a few years later. Um, I guess when I started to watch basketball, I was really like watching Kevin Garnett, even though he's sort of closer to the end of his career. Um, but just sort of the, the the passion that he had to play and and whatnot, and but you know, always love watching LeBron and and whatnot as well. So I wouldn't say I mirrored my game after anyone, but yeah, just just enjoyed what, watching certain players play. Um, obviously, um, he had a massive, I guess, breakout season this year with the with the Bullets in the NBL. Didn't start early, but then you know was thrown into the starting lineup. How was that starting your first game? Um, you know, being so young and being thrown in there and um, that whole experience of becoming a starter. Yeah, it was, I guess it was, it was cool. Like I think early in the year, I just had to, I guess, you know, prove myself and, and make sure everyone on the team knew that I was reliable and, and find myself a role that I could, that I could fill. And I think as the year went on, um, the team and, and myself just started to gain more trust in me. And um, I think when I became a starter, I think I, I was ready to, to impact the game for, in starting minutes so I mean it was pretty special walking out you know like going to do the jump ball with Andrew Bogut who you know I grew up watching and and you know was like one of the best you know big men Australia's ever produced as well and I think I, I took I did take a moment like walking out of the court thinking all right this this is pretty cool this is special but um obviously it's all it's all serious after that and I mean just after that it was just sort of yeah it was cool like yeah, I don't know what else to say about it, but yeah, I did take a moment to to realise how special it was, and obviously look up in Brisbane where I'm from, see my family in the crowd, all my friends there. Like it was, it was, it was a special night. I was going to ask that later. How cool is it? Obviously, you know, you got your boys and cool group of fellas and whatever, all your mates and friends are there to be able to come out and because not not a lot of players get to play, I guess, for their hometown in their hometown at a professional level. You know, most go and play in different teams all around. I guess the country or whatever. So to be able to play in front of your family and friends must be pretty cool as well being in Brisbane from Brisbane. Yeah, it's really special. And I think that's, you know, a massive part of of uh, why, I lo- like why I love playing for Brisbane so much is, you know, I look up in the crowd, mum and dad are there every game. You know, grandparents get there when they can. You know, my cousins, my aunties, they're there when they can get there. But like, you know, I look up always, there's sort of five or six friends <laughs> sitting in the same spot every game you know, drunk off their ass, yelling out. Like, it's it's cool being able to have that all the time. So, it's, yeah, it's special. Talk to me about the evolution of the three-point bomb. Now, <laughs> obviously, when you first came into Brisbane, um, I, I think it's a lot mental because you, your form was never shaky. Uh, it was all mental. And, you know, you used to show, struggle even shooting, you know, foul shots. And yeah. within barely two years, now you step out and, and shooting three balls. You just... Did you spend a lot of time with anyone specific in the off season, or was it just from playing QBL and getting a lot of shots up and now in game reps? Or yeah, I think I think uh, it was it was QBL helped a lot. Um, Sammy just said to me, "Mate, shoot threes, shoot, shoot, shoot threes. And even then, I was still hesitant. Like I was still, and like you said, it's a big mental thing for me. Like it was, I was hesitant. I'd shoot one. If I missed it, I wouldn't shoot again. And he's like, "No, shoot five. I don't care. I'll shoot five. Shoot." And as sort of the QBL season went on, I started to gain more confidence, understand what shots to take and what shots not to take. Um, and then that sort of built into the NBL season a little bit um, until, you know, I wasn't shooting a lot of them because, you know, I was just trying to find a role um, within the team and whatnot. Um, but, you know, spraying up a, a late late shot clock one every now and then. Uh, and then Dre sort of came up to me and said, hey, mate, like, we need you to shoot threes. So just keep shooting them every day. Uh, when you get your opportunity in the game, we want you to shoot them, so just let them go. And I think, um, yeah, just sort of in-game reps, built a bit of confidence, um, knew my teammates wouldn't be upset with me taking it, you know, just earned, earned their trust. So, yeah, it was. that's about the evolution of it. Like, I've still, I still got a long way to go. Like, I think I only shot it at, like, 20% or something, but 
you know, like you, that's that's where it's a starting point, I guess, and we'll, we'll go from there. I can't remember what game it was. It might have been against Sydney. I'm not too sure, but how good is it just to nail one and then nail another one <laughs> before you know you've knocked a couple? Like, just yeah. the feeling of like you know, shoot is good all the time. Obviously, when they just you know knocking down shots, but for some that hasn't probably been in you know big time games like that to just come in and just go bang bang, and then you know the crowds up and about and all the energy from the bench and that whole like feeling that you get. Well, I don't think I'd ever hit two or threes in a row in a game before that game. So. Um... Yeah, it was, it's cool. Like it's, like you said, shooters get all the time, but for someone that's, you know, shooting, like making that, I think that was my first three I ever made in the NBL. And then I hit my second and then my third, just back to back. And it was like, oh yeah, like I'm about to hit 10, but obviously <laughs> didn't. But uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. Like it's special. And then obviously, obviously your, uh, your forte is down the other end of the floor is, you know, defense and shot blocking. Um, you think that's just something that you've just always, had a natural gift for you know someone like Simon Dwight who Sammy knows well played for the, the Razorbacks back in the day could just yeah. like a pogo stick and just the timing and and all that stuff just came naturally is that just something you've always kind of had or you've kind of tried to work on so I think I think sort of growing up um I, I guess I'm a bit more athletic than some people would guess and, and a bit um, deceptively long so I think people are caught by surprise every now and then that I can you know get off the ground and block a shot but I think um, timing has always been natural and and whatnot. But when I was at the shoot, um, Jordan Hunter plays for Sydney. Um, you know, I went to dunk on him and he, and he blocked me pretty clean. I was like, "Whoa, like, uh, how'd you do that?" <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, I, I just watch your feet, and if if you know, if I can watch your feet, and and then I, I, I nine times out of ten I'm going to block you." And I that's when I sort of started to realise that I have a natural timing sort of gift. But I can I can develop it. I can make it better. So I started to learn how to time people leaving the ground and when I should leave the ground. And, and so it it started off as a gift, but I think it's something I've kind of worked on over the years and, and developed to an extent. So the feet the feet's a giveaway. So right. twinkle, yeah. twinkle your feet or something. Now um, yeah, you, you could try. I've obviously, <laughs> I've obviously never been above the ring, but. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's, I mean, this year, for example, that you got caught a few times, you know, Cam Oliver got you once, um, you know, maybe Sean Log, a few here and there, but yeah. does that at all play in any kind of mental thing in your head of like, oh shit, like, no. he, he's got me or <laughs> I need to jump higher or, you know, what kind of, is, is it just all in the flow of the game and you're just going up and just trying to block everything? Yeah, I, like, I guess, you know, if if there's a one on one contest, you know, like I'm not gonna back down. It's I guess my job is to make it as hard for you to score as I can. And look, if you have to dunk through my arm to put it in the to put it in the hoop, then I feel like I've made that pretty hard and, and you know, that's just part of the game. Like the best sort of you know, I'm sure you're you know, you're a pretty good guard defender. I'm sure you've fallen over a few times playing against good players and I'm sure that probably doesn't weigh on your mind too much because you know, you're know you giving it a pretty good effort. So I think that's always been my approach to it. It's just part of the game. And I've made it hard for you to score and like, congratulations to you. But next time I'm still, I'm still going to block you. So it's just having that, that mentality of, uh, don't worry, I'll get the next one. Like, so it's pretty much like shooters. If you know, they miss a three, they're not going to turn down the next three. So is there, um, is there anyone that you want to try that you haven't got yet that you want to try and just pin on the backboard? Yeah, and sure. Well, you're never going to get me because I don't go in the paint. <laughs> um, and then the whole, like, obviously it must be hard if you're guarding, you know, shooters and three-point shooters that throw up fakes and stuff to, to be able to stay down knowing that you're, you're a shot blocker. And, you know, um, I know Andre and that always used to say, just carry your hand and contest late, like be second off the floor. But as a shot blocker, you know, if you're guarding guards and they're shooting threes or whatever, is it, is it tempting just to want to go up and just swat their, their ball? It is, it is tempting, but, you know, the calibre of guard you know, in, in the NBL at the moment, you know, like John Robeson, I always wanted to block him because, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's just so small, but just so elusive. And um, he always knew sort of how to get a little bit of separation away from me just to get the shot off. Um, but it is, you know, it is tempting to just want to fly off the handle and, and, and try and go chase one down. But, you know, at the end of the day, they sort of make you pay for it. You know, you, you jump at Bryce Cotton nine times out of 10, you probably foul him. Um, you know, and then he shoots 9% from the free throw line. So it's just, I guess, learning discipline and, and you know, 
and there's a, I guess there's a little bit of a skill in that as well to, to stay down and just have a bit of discipline about it, yeah. How, how was it playing at the Armoury? Obviously, the Bullets have been at the Convention Centre for basically forever and playing there. And then just a little bit about the Bullets team. Um, you guys obviously played a lot of small ball and felt like you had a really cool group with, you know, Glizzo. And I know you hung out with Taylor a lot and obviously Lamar played as Lamar does. Um, how was that at the Armoury and, and then with that kind of group? Yeah, it was it was cool. Like, obviously, start of the season, I think the Cairns game we opened up with, uh, we had maybe 2,000 people there and it was quiet and it was dead and it was, you know, kind of just like, oh, no, like, hopefully this isn't it. But, you know, it, like, started to string some wins together at home, um, which I think built, you know, a bit of a fan base. And and like you said, we're, we're a bit of a unique team. So we had a, a fun play style I think the crowd really got into and, and 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 they loved it. So I think by the end of, you know, that we sold out the last four games and um, – built sort of an arena that was tough to come and win in. Like, I know you guys came and, and gave us a bit of a waxing one time, but, um, yeah, I mean, not, not many other teams did. So, we, like, we felt pride in playing there, and I think that's the biggest thing in, in building an arena is having a team that wants to to hold it hold it down for, for the fans and for the crowd. Um, must have been pretty cool to be named most improved. Um you know, obviously coming from a DP a couple of years later, most improved to being a starter to, you know, being a massive, like, borderline should have been defensive player of the year. Um, how good was that to, to receive that award at the NBL Awards night? Yeah. Um, awesome. I guess as much as anyone, you, you don't play for awards. Um, you know, like, you, you're out there just trying to do the best for your team. But I guess um, it is nice to be recognised for all the work you've put in and, and, you know, because personally, I know I've done the work and some people who are there with me know that I've done the work, like as much as you were there, like you, you saw how hard I was working and whatnot. But um, I guess for the whole whole league to understand how far I've come and, and, and name me in that award is pretty special. Obviously, um, I, I thought Dane was going to win it, like he was pretty deserving himself and he, he'd come as a long way. And I mean, everyone that got nominated for award this year was was pretty well deserving of it. So... I mean, just to be sort of in the conversation was enough for me and, and that gave me enough, so, yeah. Um, obviously, uh, the commentators in Corey Homicide Williams was named, dubbed you as uh, two-way magne. Um, okay. Obviously, there was a lot of hype around that, um, not only just playing on the court both ends, but um, the whole NBA, um, I guess, opportunities that kind of come from that. There was talk about um, you know, Golden State Warriors and you were going to go and, and whatnot. Talk us through that. Um, I guess how that all kind of worked out, and I know you were talking to some teams and whatnot, and um, I think there was a bit of misunderstanding around all of that NBA kind of stuff um, moving forward. Yeah, so um, I think it was after the Sydney game, um, sort of, I guess, my breakout game, you could call it, um, started to get some NBA interest, and, you know, they wanted to pester me and all the time, and, you know, as they do, they just want to get to know who you are, and I sort of... Got my my agent was pretty good and just said, "Hey mate, like I'm I'm happy to talk to him, but like, let's, can we just save it for after the season? Like, there's a lot of time between the NBL NBL season and the NBA season, so just keep him off my back till then." So, I guess I started to develop and and play a little better every game and whatnot. And um, there was uh, the Golden State Warriors had asked the Bullets if they if they had offered me a ten day contract, would the Bullets release me? So that was the conversation that went down and, and somehow that, that news got out. So there was never anything, obviously, on paper. Um, you know, there, there was interest and whatnot, but um, never anything on paper and it got out and sort of, you know, runs away like it does in the media. But um, And then, yeah, I guess after the season's finished, it's just um, I'd, I'd originally planned to visit about nine teams and do a sort of bit of a tour and a workout and, and whatnot with all the teams that, that were on my list. and. Um, obviously COVID-19 has shut that down pretty quickly. So I guess uh, I've had a few Zoom calls just, you know, with GMs and, and VPs and stuff of some teams that, um, yeah, just getting to know them and meet them. And obviously it's unique circumstances at the moment. So we've never, like, they've never done anything like this and I've never done anything like this. So just, in, I guess, try and enjoy this experience as much as possible. And yeah, just see, see what happens at the end. Just keep working. Obviously, um, anyone that's gone to the NBA would play for anyone. Do you have a team that you're like, would just be like, yeah, hey, sign me up to them? You know, like, is there someone you're like, 
should I love to play for those for those guys or with those guys or with that player? Anyone in specific? I think I'd love to play with LeBron. I think it'd be, you know, pretty special, obviously, in the conversation of the greatest player of all time and just be able to see, you know, his day-to-day stuff and how he works and, and you know, just be around that all the time, I think would be pretty special. But, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, did you watch the Jordan, The Last Dance? I did. It was, yeah. I think that that's pretty pretty cool. Um, it so sounds yeah. like it sounds like you're a LeBron fan. Are you I'm, a LeBron goat or you're a MJ goat? I'm a LeBron goat. Um, even after watching the Last Dance. Even after watching the Last Dance, I think like don't get me wrong that Jordan's obviously unbelievable, um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm I'm a LeBron goat. I'm not sitting on the fence on this. So, um, so obviously. I think you were just out of contract. Um, I know a bunch of teams would have been circling. Was it, you know, tempting at all to, to potentially leave Brisbane and, and sign anywhere else, or you just want to stay and keep that path kind of going with um, kind of what you got there with your family and whatnot? And uh, yeah, so it was, you know, it was tempting, and you know, there was some some teams reaching out and whatnot. Um, but I think for me, you know, the ultimate goal is to be in the NBA um, and to leave Brisbane you know, where I've developed so far in, in a short amount of years to get thrown into, you know, the deep end at some, you know, some team I don't know. I don't know the system. I don't know if the coaches will get along or or whatnot. So I felt for me, it was an easy decision. And this is where I develop best. Um, this is where I want to be. The coaches understand how I develop. They, they want to see me do the best I can do. Um, obviously, I have a good support network with my family and, and friends here as well. So they're, you know, keeping me going as well. So I think at this point in my career, I wasn't didn't think it was the best decision to leave, um, just solely based on development fact, developmental side of it. What's what's the uh, what's the plan moving forward? Um, obviously, the NBA is a massive goal. Um, we don't know what's going on with the COVID nineteen stuff. Who knows when that releases? Um, obviously, you have to wait to see what happens with that, but. I mean, obviously, talking to NBA teams, is there potential to, to go over and not even play in the NBA this year or is this a purely a wait-and-see kind of situation? Yeah, so I guess it's a... Like, that. that's the goal is to sort of not be in the NBA this next year. You know, as much as I love the NBA, it's, you know, my goal to be at the higher level. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a wait-and-see kind of thing. You know, if who knows when the borders will open back up? Who knows if, you know, they'll even let me in the country if, if I get an opportunity to go over there? You know, there's so many what ifs up in the air. So, I guess plan for me moving forward is to stay in the best shape I can and and, and play it as it comes. But um, I mean, if worst comes to worst, I mean, I'm I'm playing in the NBL, which is a pretty special league. So, um, I'm in a good spot, and I think you know I can't really complain too much about this whole pandemic thing because some people have a lot, awful lot. Some people have a lot worse than I do. So, it's not really a bad option, is it, to stay in the NBL and play? <laughs> Playing in your home country. Yeah, no, in my home city. Yeah, no, it's not a bad option at all. And yeah, that's cool. Um, that's that's kind of all I had. My last one was I know you um you've just recently been to the barber and like my housemate <laughs> and like Dane Pino now who looks like that Tiger King whatever his name is. Joe sure, exactly. Got rid of the 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 mullety, hawky. Yeah. Back to the sim- is that because you're coming on the podcast and you're going live or why did you get rid of the uh the Bleach blonde. I, uh, I have a uh, Zoom meeting with with an NBA team tomorrow morning. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was because of my podcast. Yeah, no, nah, mate. I, I don't. You know, I'm, you're not that special. But um, yeah, I mean, it was getting pretty old. It looked pretty dirty. I was kind of embarrassed to wear it out in public. <laughs> so I was wearing hats and whatnot. I was like, oh god, I just got to get rid of it. So I mean, yeah, it, it was fun while it lasted, but I don't think it'll be making a return anytime soon. How are the uh, how are the last one how are the how are the Zoom calls going with the you know the teams? Um, obviously, the first one or two probably would have been a little bit nervous, but is it just simply being yourself and letting them see who you are and tell them what you kind of want to do in your basketball career and just go from there? Basically, yeah, like it's just you know being open and honest and you know like understanding what they're like as an organisation and and how they operate and and how I guess I would fit in in their team as well. So. I mean, it's it's much more like a, you know, it's almost a little bit of a sales pitch from them as much as it's me just sort of letting them know who I am and, you know, and if 
you know, we might get on a Zoom call and they, they're they like, oh, actually, no, we don't want a person like this in our organisation and that's fine. But, you know, just just be who I am and, and if it comes to me, it comes to me. If not, then I'll just keep working. Is there a, a Gibbo Goes one-on-one exclusive for who might be at the top of the charts when it comes to NBA teams and who might get <laughs> Swag Nays signature at the uh, end of the year or are we just going to keep it hush-hush for now? No, it's hush-hush for now. Gibbo might, Gibbo might get a, an early... Uh, you might get an early text if, if something comes out. You might get the exclusive, but I'm not, I'll I'm take not, that. Dropping, not dropping anything on here. Fair enough, fair enough. Willie, thanks for joining me, mate. Um, stay safe up there. Hopefully, like I said to everyone, we get back to normality. And um, like everyone, I reckon, around Australia, we wish you uh, all the best in pursuing your NBA dream. And uh, I've got no doubt it'll happen within the near future. But stay safe. Don't give uh, Campbell too much grief on that court. And uh, <laughs> we'll chat soon. All right. Thanks, Kiva. Take care, mate. Cheers, bro.